you're working with a team of um, some regiment guys and the air crew to go out to the point of wounding to pick injured soldiers up. But not just soldiers, the children, the insurgents, you know, anybody that had been injured to the point where we were pumping blood in them, we were filling holes that shouldn't be there, you know. We're, and I got to a point where, and my mouth's watering now because it's just so, but you, you know, you're looking at, I was leaning on somebody's mangled leg without realising I was leaning on somebody's mangled leg and, and, and these sort of things. And that started playing on my mind. Um, I was coming back from these shouts where, you, you know, you had children with faces blown off and things, and you think, I'm stood here, I've got my body armour on, I've got a rifle, I've got a pistol on my leg, and I've got a baby in my arms, I've got half a face missing, and you think, this isn't real life and this shouldn't be real life, you know. You come back from tour, um, and you don't really have time to adjust before you were going out on another one, and there's like eight months difference. And then nine days later, you sat at a desk where somebody's telling you that an email's really important to answer. So after my second tour, which was, um, it was awful because most of the people we were trying to save was futile. I also had a battle in my head um, that I found out that some people that we'd saved, a couple of them had said, why have you saved me? What life have I got now? So I then had that going through my head thinking, well, what right did we have to play God with this guy, saving him, and what life has he got? But I now know that, you, you know, from working with, with um, training with Invictus, that actually they've got fantastic, you know, a lot of them have adjusted so, so well to it, but that held me back quite a lot. So mentally, it was awful. I got back after my second tour, and my boss um, at the time was telling me how important these things were that needed doing, and I just wanted to push a face through the window literally just go Poof, you know and I felt that anger in me and I felt like I just wanted to do it and then I just crashed on the floor and, and I, that was it for me I was gone then got back to work I couldn't do it and and, and we were in and out of work for, for quite a while um, medication counseling and then it was decided that I wasn't fit for service any longer um, purely because there was too many triggers so I got sent home on sick leave still not left at this point and Everything stopped, the support, there was nothing there. And the only support I could have is if I drove two and a half hours to the nearest military facility to then offload all these traumatic events where now my mouth's watering and, and I'm, I'm kind of think I'm over them now, so imagine what I felt like then. I was having nightmares, I wasn't sleeping. Nightmares were that bad, I wet the bed sometimes because it was just that intense and you've got no control over it. Then you're expected to drive, do whatever, drive back, you know, all medicated up as well. The expectations were just ridiculous. I then was having panic attacks, couldn't get out the front door. So the help stopped, the NHS help stopped, because if you don't turn up for two appointments, that's it, you're gone. You're just another one that can cross off that huge waiting list to them. So, you know, that was it. And I'd got to the point where I'd planned to take my own life and I'd planned it to the nth degree, uh, everything, to make it look like an accident so that no, it wouldn't upset anybody, you know. Um, and, and I think couldn't, I kind of, because I was known as Calamity Jane in the kitchen, I'm no good in the kitchen at all, <laughs> and I'm still not. And, and I was forever having accidents and cutting myself and that sort of stuff. So I'd planned to make it look like I had an accident in the kitchen and yeah. Um, and bizarrely, one day I got a letter from Safa saying I'd been removed from their services. And I was like, I didn't even know I was on your services. So I sent an email and I said, look, I said, please don't cut me off from any services. I didn't know I was entitled to anything. Um, I really need you. And, and then, you know, a caseworker came, called Eva, she was fantastic. Um, got me to the point where, you know, I, I was communicating again, because I wasn't communicating to anybody. And then, um, she got me out the front door, we went for a coffee, and, and, and it was slow, gradually moved forward. And, and then um, I got help from, from some of the superb therapists, um, Nick and Eva, and I'm at a point now where I'm moving on with my life, you know, and, and I've made a massive change. But that was really hard, but it's, it's, it's got to play, you know, this highs and lows in my career. Regiment was by far the highest, regardless of any commission or anything else. and, and 
but my career was also the break of me. It was the make and the break of me. Um, but actually turning that on its head now, I've used my experience to now support others. So it's kind of, I feel I've had to go through that for a reason, you know, and, and whatever anybody else believes or anything else are, you know, I can either turn it into something positive or live with it as a negative for the rest of my life, and I don't want to do that. But I'm kind of up here now.